Well, thank you. I haven't said anything yet. <laughs> I'd like to welcome you all and especially thank Kenny for this opportunity. I'm going to try to deliver this message as quickly as possible because the elders are finding out that I'm up here and uh, I might get pulled. So I'm going to try to get through this really quickly. A special nod today to those that are joining us online. July 4th, 1776. A couple of you might be able to understand what that date is. You might say, oh, hey, I know that date. That's when a fledgling group of uh, poorly organized, Ill ill-equipped, kind of united, mostly divided, uh, ragtag bunch of American colonies told the premier world empire, England, on that day that they are now free and independent. That was downright ridiculous. Uh, we can thank France for helping us out a bit. But on September 3rd, 1783, at the Treaty of Paris, 245 years ago, um, or no, no, I'm sorry, I messed that up. Uh, the uh, P- Treaty of Paris was seven years later. <laughs> and they agreed that this nation was actually a nation in that we were independent and that we were free. So now here we are, 245 years later. And so I wish you all a happy 4th of July, Independence Day to all of you. It's great to celebrate freedom, and freedom is a wonderful and precious thing, and it's, it's not something that many people have, but it's also something that is very easily abused as an excuse or even a right to do evil. You probably notice today that there are people saying, I have my right to do wrong. And as Christians, we're different. We're called to be different. 1 Peter 2.16 tells us, Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this nation that declares it is one nation under God. We're currently engaged in a gargantuan struggle of whether we will remain under God or not. Help us, each of us, to remain true to our roots and be a nation under God. Today, uh uh-oh, today I was just the messenger But you are a mighty, all-powerful God, and this is your message, your word. Thus, it is a mighty and powerful message. Fill and empower me to deliver it. In Jesus' powerful name, amen. Irving John Hubert was very proud to be a very strong and tough guy. I called him Grandpa Hubert. And you had one cardinal rule When you went to visit Grandpa Hubert, don't forget it. Don't get within reach of him. Because if he got within reach of Grandpa Hubert, he'd say, come here, George. I don't know why he called me George and nobody else did, but I was George to him. I must have been special. And so he would would say, come here, George, and let me rough you up. And he'd get you in a headlock and take his fist and rub it on your head. It was great. Grandpa Hubert's expressions of love often involved some pain. Um, But one day, Grandpa Hubert, I grew up in Toledo, and he took us out on his boat on Lake Erie. And we got out there, no sooner we get out the middle of the lake, and a huge storm comes up. And the clouds got black, and the rain started pelting us, and the waves got big, and we're bobbing up and down like a cork. And I was obviously very scared. I looked over at my brother, my dad was hanging on to him, and he was throwing up over the side of the boat. I wanted to throw up. I needed to throw up. I couldn't throw up. You could say I was scared pukeless. <laughs> I was. And in, then in, the, in that moment, when, when all, all seemed lost, I saw Grandpa Hubert standing there. He was standing with his legs spread for balance, and he had his hand on the wheel, and he had his other hand on the throttle, and he was, he was grim, and he was defiant, and he was determined. And he was going, he was Captain uh, Ahab going after Moby Dick. In that moment, I was glad that he was a really tough guy. But honestly, I thought, it didn't matter. It's hopeless. We aren't getting anywhere. We're just bobbing up like a cork. But then one time, in one of the waves, we went from the trough to the, to the crest of the wave. I looked. There was the dock way off in the distance, the dock we came from. And a few more waves and a few more troughs. And I looked again. And there it was. It was closer. And I was thinking, maybe, maybe. And I'll never forget the glorious moment when I planted my bare feet on that solid, wet dock. I know some of you were scared I died. I, I lived. So I, 
I do want to let you know that. I know it's pretty scary, wasn't it? Fear, extremely powerful, paralyzing, all pervasive feeling. I don't need to tell you about it, do I? Do I? You ever have your dreams become something filled with fear? We call them nightmares. It can consume us. The American Psychiatric Association lists a hundred of the common phobias. We borrowed the Greek word phobos for fear and came up with the word phobias. And so we have all these different phobias that they list. The American Psychiatric Association says there's so many of those that we can't even list them all. But Wikipedia last, uh, listed 202. You know, they're a great source for info. And a couple of the interesting ones I thought you might like is arachibuterophobia. Yeah. Uh, that's a fear of peanut butter. Well, I would think crunchy would be scarier than creamy. I don't know. Genophobia, a fear of knees. You know what the problem with that one is? You got to take two of them with you everywhere you go. <laughs> don't look down. They're still there. Oh, no. Genophobia. Obesophobia. That one you can probably figure out. A fear of gaining weight. I thought that should be fatsophobia, but... Uh, then there's ephibiphobia, a fear of teenagers. That's a valid fear. <clears throat> I had three teenagers at once, and it was very scary. Leukophobia is a fear of the color white, and papyrophobia, a fear of paper. I have a piece of white paper here, and I know how to use it. Yeah. Anybody getting scared? And then, if you don't get all of them, there's phobophobia. That's a fear of fears or fear of phobias. Remember Winston Churchill said, there's nothing to fear but fear itself. So we fear fear. But this one was my favorite. I got to put it up there for you because we're all going to read it and say it together. Everybody ready? Hippopotamonstrosis crypidiliophobia. I didn't hear anybody. Well, that was the longest part of my sermon preparation right there. Uh, no, it's not a fear of a monstrous hippopotamus. That's what it looks like, doesn't it? But guess what it is? This is serious. I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> this is a fear of long words. <laughs> <laughs> If you ever run into somebody that has that, don't tell them what they have. They'll freak out. <laughs> and whatever you do, no Mary Poppins. Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Drive them crazy. But experiencing fear is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it helps keep us alive in emergency mode when it's needed. But when we live in fear, we're on emergency mode 24-7 in our whole body, our psyche. Everything about us suffers. Some of you maybe are experiencing that, and you know what I'm talking about. In an emergency, a battery backup for a sump pump is great, but in 24 or 48 hours, it's going to be depleted. And so will you. We're not designed to live in fear, and God gave us a solution for that if we'll take it. Fear enters, it influences, it dominates our lives, and immobilizes us. Often, we don't even recognize it as fear when it's doing what it's doing to us and how it prevents us from living in faith the way God intended. And so today's message is on fear Faith and peace. Jesus calms the storm. It's based in seven verses in Mark 4, 35 to 41. Uh, in your Bible under the chairs, that's page 891. Did you know you're seated on the Word of God? That's a good place to be. Matthew 5 has it in five verses in chapter 8, 23 to 27. In Luke, just four verses, chapter 8, 22 to 25. It's amazingly brief. This is a game-changing event, and you'll see that when I get done. I consulted with all three Gospels to try to give you a, a composite, accurate picture. I did notice one thing. I, I appreciate Kenny letting me preach and all, but when Lowell Bernhardt preached, he gave him three chapters. I get seven verses. Uh, what's with that? I, I guess he knows me. He knows how long we'd be here if he gave me more. But in Mark 4.35, let's get into it. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Now, Mark 3, the previous chapter, tells us in the days before this event, people were coming to him from virtually everywhere. This was the absolute peak of his popularity. At times, he couldn't even take time to eat, Mark tells us, because he was being mobbed and there were so many people around him. He told the disciples, have a boat ready in advance so when the crowds arrive, we can go out in the water and I won't get overwhelmed. He was the first news feed on all the news medias. He set a record, a billion hits on YouTube. There were times when the YouTube server got shut down because there are so many people searching for Jesus. Everyone wanted a piece of Jesus 
Their motives and their reasons were real various. Of course, obviously, some of them coming to heal, some to hear the word. His mother and brothers came, Mark tells us earlier on, and they couldn't get to him because of the crowds, and so they were trying to uh, send word to him that he should come out because they thought he was a crazy madman at the time. They were going to pull the plug, check him into the Nazareth Asylum for the insane. The Jewish leaders spent all of their time, they're all there, and they're just left and right jabbing him, heckling and hounding and on the side plotting his death. They couldn't deny his power to heal and to exercise demons. And so they said, oh, he just does that by the power of the devil. Yeah, take that. And they couldn't think of anything else to say. Also, earlier on this day, Mark 4, 1, tells us again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. And so Mark's telling us earlier in that day that, the, that Jesus had spent the day teaching the crowds in parables. He's explaining to the disciples what he means by this stuff, and there were thousands of people. Now remember, back in that day, there was no sound system. There were no mega speakers. There was no Warren Barnes or Larry Cotner. This is a few years before they were even born. And so he had to shout everything that he said. And you ever think about that? I, I got to preach twice today for half an hour. I'll probably go take a nap. And he's having to do this. And so in summary, here's, here's the setting I thought was important. You see, I always wondered how in the world could he sleep in the middle of a hurricane? How could anybody sleep? But Jesus is totally exhausted. He's hungry. He's heckled. He's attacked, threatened. He's doing healing. Power is coming out of him. It's draining him. He's casting out demons. He's teaching. He's shouting. He's totally depleted. Just wanted a little bit of R&R. &R. And so in Mark 4, 36, it says... Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. And Mark adds this, and I thought that was cool. Did you ever notice this? There were also other boats with them. Boy, did they have a story to tell at home next day. What do you think? The Sea of Galilee is 680 feet below sea level. And there's mountains around it in several places. And so it's in this bowl, and the wind just comes down, and the hot air and the cold air mixes. And when it does in this bowl, it really goes crazy. And that is exactly what it did. In verse 37, it says, A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Now, Matthew describes it in two Greek terms. We get the word in English, mega. It's a Greek word, meaning great. Seismos, you've heard of seismologist, earthquake. A great shaking, a huge shaking. Other terms that could be fit in here is a hurricane, a gale. It wasn't just a storm. It was the storm. The boat was covered, swamped, threatening to be engulfed. If they made a movie, they'd probably call it the perfect storm. But if you do make a movie, put Jesus in the boat, not George Clooney, because Jesus will fare better. <laughs> now, the commentators say that they thought that this storm maybe was created by Satan. And he was trying to stop Jesus from getting to the other side because he heals a gathering demoniac over there and he starts a whole new ministry. And he's, they're trying to stop him. I'm not inspired, okay, but I, I really suspect quite the opposite. From what I see is happening here, I think God manufactured it. It's part of the training and the equipping of these 12 men. Who Jesus was was the next step on their long journey from fear to faith. And remember when he said, you know, who do people say I am? He was always concerned, to, what do you think? Who do you think I am? You're going to have to live and die that statement in that fact. Who do you think I am? And in Mark 4, 38... It says, Jesus was in the stern. That's the back of the boat for you land lovers. I'm one. He's sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Don't you even care? When they said, don't you even care? They're saying, is it of no concern to you that we're all going to drown? It's an accusation as well as, as an appeal. Fear can bring out the worst in us. And they were scared pukeless. How about you? Have you ever asked God in fear and anger if he even cares about what's going on happening to you? He's oblivious. He's sleeping in the back of the boat and I'm sitting here fighting for my life. It's about to go under. I've been there. I've done that. In Mark 4, 39, it tells us he got up, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Says he rebuked him. That's how he said it. And the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said two words, two words in the Greek. The first word, peace, or silence, or quiet. It's a word they used to describe a person who was a mute, couldn't speak. 
The second word, be still, be quiet, or be calm, is literally be muzzled. Stifle yourself. Put a sock in it. Jesus told nature to do that. And there's instantaneous calm. If you can, just for a moment, put yourself in that boat with those, those 12 men. And you're knee deep in water and the rain is pelting you because the wind is blowing it into you and the clouds are black and everything's going crazy. And you're going up and down on these horrible waves and you think you're going to die and you're really scared to death. And you think, what in the world is going on here? And then in an instant, you're standing there knee deep in water. The sea's completely calm. You look up and there's the moon's out and it's shining on the water and the stars are out. There's no wind. It's completely calm. He said to his disciples in Mark 440, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Matthew says he said something like this before he got up and calmed the storm. He said, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Mark says he said it after the miracle, and some people would like to say, well, that's a contradiction. It's no contradiction. He said it before and after the miracle because before the miracle, when he got up, they were afraid of the storm, and he addressed that first. Now they're afraid of Jesus, and he addressed that fear. He doesn't say, why were you afraid? He says, why are you afraid? Present tense. He, do, he says, why do you still, present tense, lack faith? The opposite of faith is cowardly fear. We're all familiar with it. Mark 4.41 says, they were terrified. And they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. It was a jumbled mix of, of amazement and wonder and awe mixed with unbridled terror and fear that shook them to the core of their being. Mark uses three words to describe how they felt. He uses that word phobos twice, first in a verb and then as a noun in that word mega. So they feared fear greatly. They were scared pukeless. But now, for a different reason, they're staring at him. And they're asking each other, what kind of man is this? Not who is this, but what is this? I thought I knew you. I don't think I know you at all. Who is this? What are you? Peter, you always have something to say. Say something. John, help me here. I can't wrap my brain around this one. Yes, I believe he's the greatest teacher ever. He's, he's proven that over and over. He's the rabbi of rabbis. He's the wisest of all people. He's the healer of every disease in every human condition just with a touch or with a word. He does this. He casts out demons with just a word. Get out of there. And it just, it's gone. He's the, an exorcist par excellence. I can believe he's the Messiah, the anointed one, maybe, maybe. But can this man be God himself? Only God does this kind of stuff. Could Jesus, this man, actually be God himself? Inconceivable. You don't hear of anybody in all history that did what Jesus just did. Nobody, nobody controls nature itself. They know only God can do that. And he didn't ask God to do it. He told nature to do it. And he only used two words. And it instantly did it. I'm scared. I didn't sign up for this. It took three and a half years to reveal himself to these men fully and convince them of who he was. And what's interesting in Matthew 28, after he's been with them three and a half years and he dies and he resurrects and he appears to them for 40 days, how can you not believe and see this? It does say they worshiped him. They got there. And Jews didn't worship anything but God. They knew that. If they worshiped him, they're viewing him as God. They wouldn't dare worship anything else. And so they worship him. But then Matthew adds four more words. But some still doubted still you got to be kidding me really jesus rebuked them for their lack of faith more than anything else it's critical because they're going to have to be bold witnesses in the face of opposition they were eventually going to lose all of their lives for it it would require a deep faith unwavering faith and so for three and a half years he poured massive amounts of miracles and wonders and signs into them in the teaching and he uses this moment in this sea to step them up to the next level of faith. Could he be God? Could this man be God? A part of the process to a greater faith 
always, sorry to tell you this, facing your fears. You're always going to have to do it. It never goes away. The path to faith goes through fear first. When Jesus said, peace be still, he wasn't just talking to the wind and the waves. He was talking to 12 men in that boat. But that's not all that he was talking to. He was ta- there were other people in that boat too that maybe you didn't heard about. See, he put this in his word. You know why he did that? Because he knew that there's going to be a group of people on July 4th, 2021, gathered at the crossing and that they needed this message. People who battle every day, every day of their lives with fear versus faith. He's talking to you. And he's still talking to me. Fear is a major theme in the Bible. The different forms of the word fear or afraid in the NIV comes up 589 times. King James bulls that one out of the water. They use it 766 times. It's all over the Bible. Right at the beginning, Adam and Eve, they sin, and they hear God walking in the cool of the garden, and, and he hides, and, and God says, where are you, Adam? And he says, oh, I hid. Why? Because I was afraid. I hid because I was afraid. It's the first time he's afraid of God. What changed? Sin. Fear comes with sin and death. Whenever God or an angel appears to somebody in the Bible, if you notice, every time their first response is fear. When the angel appeared to the shepherds announcing the birth of Christ, he said, Fear not, for I bring you good tidings of glad joy. That's how the angels talk. Everybody knows that. (laughs) And so that's how he delivered it. When uh, Jesus appears to John in the book of Revelation, he says, I fell at his feet as though dead. He can't move. He can't breathe. Jesus had to pick him up because he was overwhelmed with fear in the presence of such divinity. They were scared, or John was scared, pukeless in that situation. Fear is public enemy number one. Satan uses it as his favorite tool. He's the father of lies, and he uses it to immobilize and to paralyze you. How's he doing? Fear is a liar, and it's a good liar. It's a major theme. If you listen to Christian radio, just stop and see how many times fear comes up in versus faith. Fear is a liar. Cast your fear into the fire, because fear is a dirty, rotten, filthy liar. I improvised a little bit on that one. Oh, my soul, you are not alone. There's a place where fear has to face the God you know. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. You agree? Okay, let's stand up. Come on, everybody up. Yeah, let's go. Yeah, I mean it. Yeah, everybody up. We're going to sing that together. Ready? Just one line. You can do it. You people online out there, uh, get up your jammies, your robes. Yeah, get off of that couch. Let's go. Ready? Ready? He's serious. He really wants us to do it. Okay. Okay, you ready? My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Now, just the men. Just the men. Come on, guys. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Now, just the ladies. My fear doesn't Okay, just people online. My fear. (laughs) Great job. Okay, this is the last one. You can sit back down, but you know, just the sinners this time. Only the sinners. Ready? My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Okay, you can be seated now. Some of you are starting to nod off. This is an important message, and I... And I wanted to make sure you stay with me on this. So, anyway. 1 John 4, 18. Perfect love drives out fear. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. None of you probably remember the date February 18th, 2008. It's a date that's only special to me, I would imagine. That's the day I found out I had stage 4 cancer. I went through a nine-hour surgery... Uh, three hospitalizations, did a nice code blue one time, went through radiation, chemotherapy for nine months. I was facing my mortality head on, and I was scared. I had fear. Tim Hansel wrote a book called You Gotta Keep Dancing, and I had used that book to minister to others previously, and now I needed it, so I pulled it off the shelf, and here's what happened to Tim. He He fell off a mountain in 1975 when he was mountain climbing. He shattered his entire backbone and his neck. In one of his journal entries, the spring of 1985, 
He says, pain again, or should I say still? I haven't slept through a whole night for almost nine weeks. After 10 years, I'm weary of it. Every inch of me wants a break. I feel like a butterfly that's still alive but pinned, wiggling to a board. Aspirin, pain pills, prayer, more prayer, more aspirin, more pain pills. Sometimes nothing seems to work. Another entry. I can't remember when I last woke up feeling good. Each morning continues another layer of nauseating pain, stiffness, the dull gray ache, the never-ending fatigue. It's been a little over 10 years since my accident. Life was different then. I just can't remember what it felt like. Tim Hansel gave me some gems, and I hung on to them during my blessed trial with cancer is what I call it, and I, and I want to give them to you too. If something's in red print, if you don't hear anything else, remember anything else, remember the red print. He said, all our theology must eventually become biography. When I got my cancer, all those scriptures that I had uh, used to win prizes in Sunday school and those scriptures that I used to uh, get points for my team at, at camp, scriptures I used in Bible college to get good grades, scriptures I used to preach and to teach to other people, scriptures that I used at funerals and crisis situations and counseling situations, all those different times, I had to stop and look and see, okay, what do I believe? Is this there? Is it true? Do I truly believe it? On September 20th, 20th 1964, I accepted Christ and said, I'm putting my faith in him. Am I going to stay with it or am I going to shrink back in doubt and fear? And I found out what I truly believed. I came up with a two-word adage that I now live by daily. You might get tired of hearing me say it. I don't care. Two words, simply two words in red print. Choose faith. When your lifeboat is about to sink, as the storm rages on, and Jesus is asleep in the back of your boat, choose faith. The second gem that he gave me that impacted my life amidst my trial, I carry it within me daily. I want to give you that one too. It's in red print too. Faith isn't faith until it's all you're holding on to. I add an addendum to that one. Faith isn't faith until it's all you're holding on to. And when it is all you're holding on to, it's more than enough. I studied Job when I had my cancer because he pleased God and he did it without sinning. And I thought, I want to do it that way. So I did a very intense study of him. My trial didn't compare with his. I don't want to, I don't want to say that comparison, but it's all I could handle. And so I studied him because I wanted to please God like he did. And in Job 3, 25 to 6, he says, What I feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has happened to me. I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest, but only turmoil. But then in Job 13, 15, he says, Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. God knew what Job was made of, but Job didn't yet. And God used Satan to grow Job's faith. I wanted to do that too. In Job 2, 10, he says, Shall we accept good from God? And not trouble? Are we just in it for the good times? When trouble comes, are we going to turn away from God, fall away? This next one became my guiding text. It's on my bedroom dresser still. If you want to see it, you can. You just got to give me a notice so we can get the bed made. But it says, he knows the way that I take. And when he's tested me, I will come forth as gold. I hung on to that all through my trial. I stubbornly chose faith and to hang on to it. The most precious thing we can offer God is our faith. He'll do anything to increase it within us. Just ask Job. He had a great faith, but it was greater afterwards. I didn't welcome my blessed trial with cancer. I don't want to go there again. But God used it to test, to build, to refine, and to grow my faith. And if we choose faith, that's what happens. It grows best in the hard times. I'm a cancer conqueror, not a cancer survivor, by the mercy of God. I thought I had faced my greatest trial. <laughs> I thought it doesn't get any worse than this. But then on July uh, 29th, 2013, my wife of 42 years succumbed to cancer. And she preceded me to heaven. And I was plunged into a dark place. Fear threatened to swallow me whole and to consume me. I wasn't afraid to die. I wanted to die. I was afraid I couldn't figure out how to live. I stood in my home alone in the dark and screamed, I hate this. I can't do this. Please don't make me do this. I placed scriptures on fear and faith all throughout my home in every room trying to survive. Hebrews 13, 5, 
is one of them. God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? I reread The Anxiety Cure by Archibald Hart. I'd used it in ministry to others. Now I needed it. And I stubbornly decided to continue to choose faith no matter what, no matter how I felt. And I hung on to, he knows the way that I take. When he's tested me, I will come forth as gold. And I found in time, there's no way around grief. There's no way around fear. But I also found there's always a way through grief and always a way through fear if you choose faith. I knew that there was life after death for my wife, but I also found out there was life after death for me. I chose faith. How did everybody come out? And it's all these things I've told you. The 12 apostles, one of them lost his faith. He didn't choose faith. He betrayed Jesus. The other 11 chose faith and they were martyred for that faith as they stubbornly hung on to it. Tim Hansel says, Although I could not bear the thought of having to repeat some of the experiences of the past 10 years, I cannot imagine my life without them. I know that the assets have far outweighed the losses and liabilities. Really? Really? But I still, I confess, had I known what would be involved, I would probably not have had the courage to sign up for the course. Tim lived in pain until God took him in 2009 to his eternal reward for remaining faithful. Tim chose faith. The Apostle Paul was faced a similar test to, to Tim Hansel. He couldn't heal himself. He had some kind of an ailment. And he could heal other people, he even performed a resurrection. And he pleaded with God three times. He begged him, God, please, come on. And then God gives him this answer to this messenger from Satan, the sore in the flesh. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Sometimes that's the answer. Sorry, that's it. But Paul still chose faith, and he was glad that he did. What happened with Job? Well, he was blessed twice as much after he stood the test than he was before the test. And so uh, he was really blessed before it. How did Dave Hubert come out? I know you're all curious. <laughs> God gave me a Margie. <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to talk about that because you just watch me do a little crying or something. So we're going to go on. For the next question, we're getting near the end here. Hang in there. Doors are locked. Uh, the officer on duty has a taser. Don't try to get out of here. Okay, I'm going to ask the question. Don't even try to get out of here. But I'm going to ask it. You aren't going to like it. What are you afraid of? What are you? First of all, you're afraid of that question. <laughs> but what are you afraid of? Jesus is in, in the boat, was doing a faith check versus fear check with the apostles. He did faith checks with Tim Hansel, with uh, Paul, with Job, with me. He does faith checks with you also. How is your faith or the lack thereof? Is Jesus asking you, why are you so afraid? Do you still lack faith? Is he asking you that? It can be scary. There are countless kinds of fears that everybody faces regularly. Um, I can't begin to list them all, but I just want to list a few. Fear of loss, rejection, evil, persecution, Failure, death, commitment, pain, change, being alone, the dark, the unknown, the future. I, I'm, I'm afraid I'll lose my job. I'm afraid I'll lose my home. I'm afraid I'll lose my loved one. I'm afraid I can't recover from losing my loved one. I thought about applying for the job, but the interviews scare me. I don't like things the way they are, but I'm afraid to change it. I might make it worse. I'm, I'm afraid about, uh, I'm going to put out a fear thing here, Urgh, the fear mask. This little piece of people afraid of that. A lot of anger and conflict with this thing too. Just this little piece of material. A small part of me, honestly, uh, actually misses the mask because I got a lot of compliments. A lot of people said I look better with it on. So, that is a compliment, isn't it? Anyway, I'm afraid for the future of the United States in today's political climate. People are so angry, vicious, divided. Evil's rearing its ugly head. I'm afraid to say anything about it. I'd like to join a small group. I'd like to make new friends, but I'm afraid I wouldn't fit in. Afraid I, I wouldn't like them. Afraid they wouldn't like me. I'm afraid they'd find out how ignorant I am about the Bible. I, I don't even know how to pronounce Zephaniah, let alone find it in the Bible. Some of you are saying, there's Zephaniah in the Bible? Yeah, yeah, look it up, it's there. I know that coworker, that neighbor, that relative needs Christ. I want to witness to them, but I'm afraid to bring it up. 
I'd like to give some money and an offering, maybe even tithe. I'm afraid I wouldn't make it. In the parable of the talents, the one man said, I was afraid, so I hid my talent in the ground. You and I would never do that, would we? I thought about volunteering to serve in a ministry, but I'm afraid to take a chance. It, it wouldn't work out. I'm afraid to make the commitment. I'm, I'm afraid I'd be sorry. Are you afraid to die? Hebrews 2, 14 to 15. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too, Jesus, shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Jesus came to deliver you from that fear. Do you still fear it? And this last one is one I run into all the time in my years of ministry. I'm afraid I've gone too far from God. I've done too much wrong and evil. It's just too much for God to forgive. Let me tell you something. It's a done deal. Jesus has already paid the price for everybody's sins, everybody's for all time, past, present, future. And God, as a result, is offering forgiveness already extended to everyone. That's already done. You only have to think about it. The only thing is left. Will you accept that forgiveness or not? Will you choose faith? What are you missing out on life because your fear stops you? Fear can be dominating, overwhelming, paralyzing. It wars against the faith that saves us and blesses us. Hebrews 10.39 says, But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. And so there's three doors. Three doors you have to open in the same order. Fear is the first one every time. Sorry, it's the way it is. You'll always have to face down your fears. You do that by choosing faith. And when you choose faith, it leads you to the peace door. That's the cool part. Paul said, I found the secret of being content or at peace in any and every situation. That secret, facing your fears, choosing faith, results in peace. These same 12 apostles faced a deja vu event. Same group, same lake, same storm, same boat, same darkness. They're saying, oh, not again. And this time, Jesus isn't even with them. He's out for a leisurely stroll on the lake in the middle of the night in a hurricane. But also, this time, one of the guys in the boat starts to get it. Peter steps out of the boat. You remember that story? Peter's the guy that went down in the water. Peter's also the guy that, besides Jesus, stood on water. How many of you have done that one? But he did because he was starting to choose faith. The other 11 stayed in the boat with the rest of us. He chose faith. And this time when they got, he got back into the boat, it says they all worshipped him. Remember, they only worship God. They recognized him as God. They were getting it, all of them. And they began to choose to put their faith in him. How about you? Right here, right now, will you come past your fears, step out of your boat, in the midst of the storms in your life, and choose faith. There's crosses on both sides of this room. Don't be afraid of what others will think. Just keep looking to Jesus. Step out in faith. Say no to your fears. Face them down through faith. If you've never taken that step past your fears, choose faith. Bury your doubts, your fears, your sins in the waters of baptism, and then rise to a new life with peace in Christ, you'll discover that fear indeed is a liar. The worship team is going to come out. I asked for this song. I love this song. And I want you to enjoy it, but I want you to hear the message and the words. Let it minister to your soul. And while that song is being sung, just go to one of the crosses. Say no to your fear. Choose faith. Go to a cross as they sing this song. Let's pray together. Lord, this message today applies to everyone here, including the speaker. Nobody is immune to it. Fear invades all of our lives in so many ways and so many times. It comes unbidden, unwelcome, unexpectedly in a moment. And when it does, we cry out, I believe, help me to overcome my fear and unbelief. Today and every day, remind us to choose faith and give us the strength to do so. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.